Hello, brothers and sisters. Today I'd like you to consider the pervasive kingdom that will prevail. Pervasive. Something that is pervasive. Well, when I think of that in a very negative sense, I often think of my allergic reaction to poison ivy. I break out terribly whenever I get poison ivy. I have to take immediate uh, very serious action anytime I start to get a little itch or scratch or start to see it uh, bubbling up because I will break out and it will pervade and spread uh, throughout my entire body. Uh, much like in the springtime, if you have a garden, uh, it's probably fascinating and frustrating to imagine how quickly the weeds will pervade and take over in that garden. Well, what about in a positive sense? Don't you wish the good things in life were as pervasive as weeds and the spread of poison ivy? Well, that is exactly how Jesus, in one sense, thought about his kingdom of grace. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus shared a number of parables. But in one of those parables, in verse, verses 31 and 32 of Matthew chapter 13, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Jesus wanted his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven and his kingdom of grace, and ultimately his kingdom of glory, to be pervasive, to grow like a mustard seed. Jesus didn't stop there. In the very next passage, verse 33 of Matthew 13, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until it was all leavened. Just think of the pervading influence, the permeating power of leaven. It spreads throughout the whole loaf and causes it to rise. Jesus longs for his kingdom of grace to permeate our lives and to pervade everything in our lives and to prevail as, his, as he sits on the throne of our hearts and our minds. I found it interesting as I looked, if you're familiar with BibleGateway.com. You can have a search engine there. And I searched for king or kingdom. And I noticed that out of all the books of the New Testament, for example, Matthew speaks of kings and kingdoms more than any other book, by far more than any other book in the New Testament. And Matthew was writing to establish that Jesus was the promised Messiah King that the Old Testament foretold. And he was coming to establish the kingdom of heaven in human hearts here on planet Earth. And Jesus over and over again would tell, tell parables about the kingdom of heaven. That how it would work in human hearts and to this planet until the moment where it not only permeates and pervades through our hearts as we allow it to grow and mature, but ultimately... When Jesus will sit upon the throne of his glory and establish his kingdom of glory, ultimately in the future, it will prevail and permeate and pervade everything on this planet. It's very interesting, though, as we said before, that when Jesus came into his own, they said, we have no king but Caesar. And Jesus would contrast his kingdom with the kingdoms of this world. In Luke chapter 22 Verse 25, Jesus would say, The kings of the Gentiles, the kings of all the other nations of this world and all the fallen kingdoms of this world, they exercise lordship over people. They order people around and throw the weight of their power around to make people follow them and obey them. But Jesus says, It will not be so among you. He says, We will influence others by serving them. We will treat people with respect, and that is how we will gain influence in their lives, not by force and not by power, as all the other kingdoms of this world operate. You see, Jesus came to establish a kingdom, a kingdom of grace, and it was always a threat to Caesar. 
and the power of the Roman Empire. Matthew opens with the story of the wise men coming from the east and they come into Jerusalem and say, where is the one born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star and we have come to worship him. That immediately raised red flags for King Herod. He felt this was a threat to his power and his kingdom and his authority within the Roman Empire. And we know from the story that he would later cause all children two years of age and younger to be murdered in Bethlehem because that's where the Old Testament prophet said the baby Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So this Jesus, even at his birth, immediately became a threat to those within the Roman Empire. And as the New Testament spread, everything about the language of the New Testament was really a threat as this pervaded the Roman Empire, as it began to permeate through the territories of Rome, as you see in the book of Acts, Paul spreading the gospel to the then known world. Think about that. For Rome, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. If you want peace on this fallen planet, then you need to be under the power of the Roman Empire. Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. Instead, in the New Testament, we see the disciples spreading the peace of Christ. Grace and peace, which is a term in the New Testament we read a lot, was a term that often spoken of in the Roman Empire. Grace and peace comes from Caesar, but in the New Testament, in the kingdom of grace, peace, grace and peace come from Christ. In the Roman Empire, there is only one Lord, and that one Lord is Caesar. But in the kingdom of grace of Christ here on planet Earth, there is one Lord, and that one Lord is Jesus Christ the Messiah. In the Roman Empire, every knee would bow and tongue confess that Caesar is Lord. But in the New Testament, Paul would speak of every knee bowing and every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah King, he is the Lord. We know from a document from the second century AD, which is called the Martyrdom of Polycarp. It describes the execution of the Christian bishop of Smyrna named Polycarp, and he was killed in the mid-150s AD, and he was killed, he was martyred for his faith because he refused to publicly say, Caesar is Lord, and instead he said, Christ is Lord. And he was burned at the stake and stabbed with a spear in executing him because he said, Christ is Lord, instead of Caesar is Lord. The word we said last time, the good news of of uh, the kingdom, the good news of God's reign that we mentioned in day 10, that was uh, that term gospel originally meant that it was the spreading of the good news of Caesar's reign. But the New Testament authors and Jesus picked up this title and he says the gospel is the good news of Christ's reign, his kingdom of grace here on planet earth, ultimately leading to his kingdom of glory when he sits on the throne of his glory when he returns. It's also interesting that the Greek term ekklesia was the assembly of citizens to conduct kingdom business, uh, empire business, citizen business, civil business. But in the New Testament, the ekklesia became the term for the assembly of the church to conduct Christ's kingdom business, the mission of the church. Over and over again, the New Testament is using these terms and taking them from the context of the kingdom of Rome, the Roman Empire, and attributing them to Christ. And Christ was become the pervading influence within the kingdoms of this world to truly lead people to experience the grace of Christ and to come under his lordship and his uh, wonderful grace and sovereign reign. Interesting that in the Old Testament, one of the books of the Old Testament that speaks the most about God's kingdom is the book of Daniel. And God's kingdom pervades and permeates that entire Old Testament book. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, Daniel will uh, interpret a vision of the king of Babylon, who was the ruling power of that day. And he said, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed and no one will ever conquer it. It will shatter all these kingdoms into nothingness. But it, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the God of heaven, that kingdom will stand forever. 
And that was symbolized by an, a, an image that represented all the, the kingdoms of this world. And then a stone cut out without hands came from heaven and demolished that kingdom. And it says that it would then, that, that stone became a mountain that grew until it encompassed the whole world. The pervading and permeating power of God's kingdom. The kingdom from heaven that right now, the kingdom of grace, is seeking to permeate and pervade all the hearts and minds here on planet earth who are willing, who out of love and out of joy surrender, believing that the best is found in life as we come into harmony with the will and the ways of our great God. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 44, Jesus speaks of a stone as well. The stone which the builders rejected would become the chief cornerstone. And he says, whoever falls on Jesus as the chief cornerstone of their life, yes, you will be broken into pieces, but you will be built up into his kingdom. But whoever that stone falls upon will be crushed, which is, sounds just like the Daniel 2 image where a stone comes from heaven and crushes all the kingdoms of this world. Today, I pray that each one of us would become to know in our hearts and in our minds the pervasive kingdom that will prevail. God's kingdom is the only one that will last forever. And now in God's kingdom of grace, he is seeking to permeate and pervade our hearts with the principles of his law, the principles of his kingdom, the principles of his will, and the principles of his character. He wants to become change our priorities, change our values, change our identity, and change what we change what we choose so that we choose God's will instead of our will. And one day soon, when Jesus comes in all of his glory and he's seated upon his throne of glory, he will crush out all the other kingdoms of this world so that only his kingdom is around. Only it survives and it lasts forever. Today, God is inviting each one of us to be a part of his pervasive kingdom that will ultimately prevail when Jesus comes. And today, if you choose, he can prevail in your heart and mind by joyfully, lovingly bowing the knee to Jesus and saying, Christ is Lord. Christ is King of my heart. And I believe in the good news of his kingdom. And I believe that he is where grace and peace are truly found. I pray that today you're allowing the kingdom of his grace to pervade and permeate your entire being, every aspect of your life. And one day we will be among those who prevail with Jesus when he sets up his eternal kingdom. Keep on keeping on, brothers and sisters. May you trust that Christ is Lord and let him be king of your life. In Jesus' name.